Hey, what's up guys? So today we're gonna be building out this looping, abstract, wet road animation together. I originally created this scene for the Endless Engines Top 100 montage that we did a few weeks ago. So let's rebuild this in Cinema 4D, but if you're in Blender or Unreal or Maya, 3DS, whatever, you can follow along and implement some of these same tips and tricks. I'm gonna walk you guys through a lot of cool stuff like how to add realistic looking puddles to this wet asphalt, how to get those reflections popping with HDRIs and IES lights, and I'll even show you guys how to add these cool asphalt patches as well. We're gonna add realistic camera shake and I'm gonna show you how to set up aces inside of Octane. So let's just jump right in. The first thing I wanna do is get a road. And there's lots of ways you can do that. You could go to polygon.com and grab some of their roads here. Quixel Bridge I know has roads as well. Or you could go out and photo scan a road say with your phone or even with a drone. You could do long stretches that way. So I believe this is a polygon material and I'm just gonna make a plane here. I'm gonna drop this onto the plane and we have, as you can see, a road chilling here, but I wanna duplicate it. So with the plane selected, let's hold Alt and I'm gonna pop that into a cloner and it's cloning it along the wrong axis. I want it to be cloned along this axis. Yes, perfect. And let's go ahead and open this up. Let's see how long, let's see how big this is. 400 centimeters. So we want to duplicate it by 400 centimeters and give ourselves enough runway here so we can go as fast as we want. All right, so we have a road, but now what do we do with it? Let's make a camera. You can do this a number of different ways. You can hit Shift C and type in camera and make a camera like that. Or in the Octane Live Viewer, you can go to Objects Octane Camera, but I made myself a little button right here. And I'm going to hop into the camera. If I hit Shift V, that's gonna bring up our safe frames. And I know I want this to be kind of a widescreen setup. So I'm gonna to go to my render settings here and let's do like 1920 by 810. That's gonna be that nice 237 aspect ratio, 24 frames a second. We're gonna render all of our frames here. Control D will bring up your project settings, your attributes, and I'll set that to 24 as well. So now we're in a true 24 frame timeline here. And I'm going to actually animate this camera along a spline to make things easier. I'm gonna go into my front view. I'm just hitting the middle mouse button. I lied, it's the side view. Yes, side view. Let's go ahead and grab this little spline pen here. I'm gonna do a spline point here, a spline point there. I'm gonna hit zero to grab this rectangular selection tool. Grab both of those, right click, and make sure they're set to hard interpolation. That means there's no Bezier curves. They're just two points in the wind. Now, I wanna make sure that these are along the same like Y axis. So a shortcut to do this, if you hit uh, T for scale, and you grab this Y and hold shift, bring it all the way down to zero, it'll even those two out perfectly. Another way to do it is go down to this little bottom guy and make sure that both of these should be set to 100. And then you know that's a straight line. So let's move this point here. Let's move this point down here. Now we have a spline kind of over this road and I wanna connect the camera to it, right? So what we'll do is we will right click this camera and we're gonna to go to animation tags, align to spline, boom. And we're gonna drag that spline right into the spline path. And if we hop into our camera and we animate this position, we can start to see is getting us the look we want. So I'm gonna give myself a little bit more frames to work with. Let's say 150 frames. And we're gonna take this align to spline tag, make a keyframe on the position, go to the very end and set that to 100 and close that keyframe out. Make sure, very important, close that keyframe out. All right, so back to frame one. You'll notice though, it starts up and it ramps up. We get to speed and then we kind of slow down. It looks really weird. We don't want that, especially if we want this thing to loop too. What I'll do is select this keyframe. I'm gonna go to this spline type and just set it to linear. I'm gonna do that for both of these guys. So now we just snap into that full motion. But you actually notice, look, it's still doing it. It's still ramping up and ramping back down. And I think it has to do with our spline. And if we change the intermediate points to say uniform, then we'll start to be moving linearly from point A to point B. And that's exactly what we want, especially when we want this thing to loop. So let's adjust our camera angle a little bit, um, as well as the spline height. So we can bring this spline down just a little bit closer to the road. That means more motion blur is gonna be whipping by. I also wanna take this camera, kinda position it here. We can move the spline over to 
so that we're like actually in the road. And we can as well, we can select the camera and maybe take it to like a 50 or something. A little bit more cinematic, but I like this. Boom, that is, that is moving. I love it. So obviously the first frame has emptiness, so I'm gonna grab that first point on our spline and just move it back until we fill the frame there. This feels great to me. Let's see what it looks like in render view. And this looks not <laughs> how we want it to look, but that's okay because the next thing we're gonna work on is lighting. I'm gonna go ahead and like dock this over here so we can kind of see both. So I wanna start with an HDRI. With Octane, you can use this HDRI environment. What we can do here is drop in any HDRI that we want into this slot. HDRIs are essentially full 360 images taken at different exposures to give you a full range of the brightest brights and the darkest darks, and it's gonna light your scene in an accurate way. One of my favorite places to get HDRIs is actually Polyhaven. They do models, they do HDRIs, they do materials. It's all free, it's all super high res, and you can search from all these different styles of HDRIs, but the one I'm gonna be using today is called Manhattan Nights. Um, a guy from New York actually took these in Manhattan, and I'm gonna be using a plugin from Grayscale Gorilla called HDRI Link, and it's the quickest way to add HDRIs and swap between them in C4D, it's my favorite. We just need to take this environment tag, drag the texture into this link right here, boom, and if we open it up, this is the plus library, Grayscale Gorilla Plus. We can go to user HDRIs, we got Manhattan Nights, and we can just kind of start swapping through these to find the look we want. But we don't need to get too locked in here, but we need to work on the reflections because I want it to look rainy, right? And the best way to do that, in my opinion, yes, you can use noise and you can plug the noise into the specular channel, or the roughness channel. But what I like doing is using an asset pack called Puddle Maps by Dizzy Viper. And he put together these incredible wet puddle textures for you to use in any program you want. You're gonna get some really realistic puddles here. So let's take a look at what's actually making this wet reflective road. Right now, by default, everything is just wet, right? But it's these puddle maps that are really taking it to the max. So I'm only using two of them and I'm combining them with the roughness from the actual road material. So I think I'm using this map here. It's basically saying anything that is black, there's no roughness, and anything that's white, the reflection is spread out so much so that it looks like it's not even reflective. That's our first one. I'm using this other one to kind of simulate uh, tires. So I'm combining those two to get us this look right here. We're plugging this into the roughness channel, right? Each one has their own transform that I'm using to scale up and scale down. Obviously you can see that tiling now, we don't want that. And I'm going through and I'm giving these octane gradients. And these gradients, I'm using them to really art direct the way the light bounces off of this road. So that's really it when it comes to the puddle maps. As soon as we add motion blur, right? With the Octane camera, you have the Octane camera tag. There's a motion blur section and I'm gonna hit enable and definitely save this before we do this. The shutter, right? Since we're at 24 frames per second, technically we'll be at double that or half that. So one over 48. So 24 doubles to 48 and you're gonna go one divided by 48. Boom. Look at that, dude, that looks, that looks great. That looks so good already. All right, we're getting much closer to our final look. The motion blur really, really adds to this so much. It looks like we're on a tarmac or something, but we're not done. We got a lot more to do here, a lot more tricks to utilize. So Asus, the sponsor of today's video, is putting on their Pro Artist Awards for 2023, and I am honored to be the judge in the animation category. It is a free to enter global challenge with a bunch of sweet prizes. So myself and Asus challenge y'all to make a piece of 3D art that speaks to the theme of seeing an incredible future. An incredible future could be a number of things. Could be the freedom to create freely, could be a beautiful world where humanity and nature 
live as one. Now, there's a few categories, but for the animation category, there's gonna be two winners. So the runner up is getting a ZenBook Pro 16X OLED display laptop for creating your goodness on the go, as well as a ProArt Z790 Creator Wi-Fi motherboard. But the winner, y'all, the winner is gonna get a ProArt StudioBook 16 OLED laptop along with an Asus Pro art display. There's also potential for the winning artist to have their art as the official demo project on Asus's new Spatial Vision 3D OLED display technology. That means your art is gonna be popping up into people's living rooms. That's gonna be pretty sweet. You know, and also on top of all that good stuff, the winner gets just 10,000 bucks. How about, how about 10K? That sounds nice. Submissions open today, that is April 15th, and that goes all the way through July 15th. The winners will be announced soon after. And I, I know someone from this community, one of y'all is gonna win this. We've been doing these challenges for so long, let's show Asus what we can do. So click that link down below. Even if you just wanna do it for fun, that's honestly more important. Click that link, learn a little bit more about this challenge that Asus is holding and see how it can inspire you guys to make your next piece of awesome art. And speaking of art, let's get back to ours. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is something that I found when I was driving home one night. The headlights of the car behind me, it was far enough back that it reflected off of the asphalt and it helped because it was a rainy night and it looked exactly like what I was creating here so I wanted to double down on that. So let me walk you guys through how IES lights work. But first off, what the heck is an IES light? An IES light is just a profile for your light shape. So there's a few packs that you can find online for free. I'll drop them down in the description below for you guys. And let me just load one up here. All right, so Octane has its own IES light set up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click that. Uh, let's go in here and we're going to drag and drop one of these IES profiles. We'll hit no. And the first thing you'll notice is it doesn't really look like it's working, but trust it is. You just need to scale down this light We'll bring it up out of the ground just a little bit. We can kind of see that shape, definitely, but let's make it more intense. We want to uncheck surface brightness. And look at that. We have a super cool shaped light here. I also want to change the color temperature of this light. If we go to the temperature, I'm going to just set it to 4200, right? So it's more of like a tungsten. And if we hop into the camera, and we actually need to find where the heck our camera is, in comparison with this light. All right, our camera's way down there. Let's just go to the middle of the of the render here. Let's see, yep, there it is. Let's go to update check, let's uncheck camera. That way when I hop out of the camera, the viewport will still be live. And we just wanna find that nice balance. We can back it off, raise it up, lower it. That's not bad right there, actually. I like that. So I'm gonna duplicate it, because obviously we want two headlights, right? So holding control. We got two headlights back there. It's looking really nice. If we go into our Octane camera tag, we can actually go to the camera imager. We can check that on. And we have some extra options in here, which are really nice. We can actually do some hot pixel removal and bring this down. But at a certain point, it starts to get a little crunchy, right? So we need to find the right balance. We need the right amount of samples. So we can throw maybe 500 samples at it and let it render just a little bit longer and it'll clean that up just a bit. We can also enable spectral denoiser. Once it gets to 500, it will denoise it, All right? So this is intense. We can blend it here, right? So we just work in a little bit of that denoise. I'm a sucker for vignette too. Um, so I'm gonna crank that up just a bit. And it really starts to bring the focus of the scene on that center highlighted bit. I like those lights. Now, obviously you saw I scrubbed, but the lights didn't come with. And I'm going to take both of them and make them a child of the camera. So wherever the camera goes, those lights are also going. So the next thing I wanna show you guys is how to get these like asphalt crack fill in looking things. I don't know exactly what they're called, but this look is so cool to me. It's such a cool way to break up the render and I just wanna have these things whipping by, giving you these crazy looks and just kind of mesmerize you. So let's let's build this out. So let's make a new scene. Let's get rid of this, all right? Here's what I'm gonna do. Let's make a plane, I'll scale it way up. Uh, let's get a figure as well so we know what we're dealing with. Let's grab another plane 
let's go NB, right? So I wanna open this up, open this up. And to me, what that image looked like was a bunch of noodles dropped on the floor and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna give this enough to work with here, something like this perhaps. I'm gonna make this editable by hitting C. And let's go to the line mode. I'm just gonna randomly select with this selection tool a bunch of these lines, just like this. So we're gonna right click this and convert these edges to a spline. Now, if we pull that spline up and we hide our plane, right, we have this shape here. This is awesome. Let's go ahead and give it some thickness. So I'm gonna make a circle spline. We'll scale that down. I'll grab both of these, the circle spline and the spline grid. I'm gonna hold Control Alt and I'm going to drop it into a sweep. And look at that, we got some stuff. I'm gonna bring this sweep up into the air. And if I take that spline, let's go to point mode, grab all those points. I'm gonna chamfer all of these edges here just so they're all rounded out. And if we right click the spline and go to our simulation tags and give it a rope tag and we hit play, then it's gonna fall through the floor because we need to give our plane a collider tag. Boom, and that is wonderful. That is wonderful. But how do we get them to like worm out, right? All you need to do, I'm gonna hit Shift C, I'm gonna find turbulence and let's just bring that in here. By default, it's just okay. So I want to bring this up by 100. Just make it crazy, the scale's too large, so we need to scale it to like, I don't know, 50%, so it's all wacky. Yes, all right, so now we have to mess with our rope tag. So bendiness, let's try five. Yeah, okay, still a little, uh... oh, let's go to the, the spline and set the intermediate points to uniform. There we go. Yes, yes, that is exactly, exactly what we want. I just wanna get a black and white view of this. So I believe the simplest way to do that would be to drop a white luminescent material on the sweep and a black material without reflection onto the plane. Okay, so when we render this in the viewport, this is perfect, right? Let's go like 4,000 by uh, 1,500. But you see all this weird stepping right here? We don't want that at all. So what we need to do is actually under our settings here, under our viewport renderer, it should be anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing, yes, FXAA. And we want geometry only for the filter. Let's render it again and see if it gets rid of this default camera and our, yes, here we go. Boom, that's perfect. So I'll save this out as a PNG and let's go back into our scene here. We're gonna hop out of the camera. I'm gonna make a plane, 4,000 by 1,500. We'll rotate it and we're gonna have this live just above our road. I'm gonna move it up like 0.1 centimeters. We're gonna make a new material, in my case, an octane material. We're gonna drop it onto this plane. And if we drop it into the opacity, and oh my goodness, that looks like some ramen. What on earth is happening? There's a glitch in the matrix, y'all. It works, it totally works. Let's scale it down. We can even stretch it out if we want. We can duplicate it, flip it around. We can even simulate a couple other ones if we want, but for this, I think totally works. Let's go ahead and adjust the material itself though, because it's not right. First thing we'll do is actually change the diffuse color. I'll just grab like the color of this road. And then all we need to do is just kind of up the roughness of this thing and we start to get that look that we're going for. And with motion blur, let's turn that back on. We really want them to stand out. We can take the index of reflection up to say like five and they'll start to really pop out of this thing. I could set it to one and they're gonna be just chromed out. It really is a subtle touch that comes together when you're just whipping through this road. It adds to that like speed line kind of effect that we're getting here in a very realistic kind of way. 
So the last thing I want to talk about is camera shake. And there again is a number of ways that you can do this. You can film some camera shake yourself with your camera, track that footage and apply it to your shot after it's rendered. But I love doing it in the program because that way the light reacts 100% realistically with the shake that you're putting into it. I know uh, Ian Hubert has a really cool camera shake plugin for Blender if you guys are on that side, but the way I'm gonna do it is actually with another Grayscale Gorilla plugin called Gorilla Cam. And what it does is it references your original camera, makes an instance of it essentially, and adds this Gorilla Cam tag to it. And all of your camera shake settings are gonna be controlled via this tag right here. So what I like doing, just right off the bat, going to zeros, okay, because I can build up from, from no shake. If we hit play, and we keep it very subtle, guys, very, very subtle. If I take rotation fast to like 100, medium, let's just play with this. Let's see what we can do. We can have like two degrees of some slow rotation, but really that is about it. You know, we can smooth out that camera shake by 50%. All kind of different looks you guys can get out of this. So one other thing I want to do to add a bit more chaos to this very simple scene is to actually just orbit my HDRI a little bit. And now would be the time to actually go through your HDRIs and find one that you feel works best for your scene. On the first frame, I'm going to make a keyframe on the rotation X. And we can see that this is going to give us a bunch of different looks here as we rotate this horizontally and we're going to go to the very end and let's set this to one which will be a full 360 close out that keyframe i'm also going to make sure these keyframes are set to linear that way they just start moving from frame one that's going to add a nice bit of variety to our road and to this little intro graphic like that that's so cool now before i render this out i want to show you guys how to set up aces in c4d it's a lot easier than you think but it really is going to be perfect for this for those of you who don't know aces is a certain color profile and it's going to treat our light information in a very specific way that allows us to get the most out of our highlights the most data out of our shadows and it's just going to make for the cleanest image possible when we export this thing you're going to download the link in the description it's this open color io folder this aces 1.2 folder there there might be a more updated one at this point, but what I'm looking at is this config.icio file. That is the file right there. And what we're gonna do is go up to Octane, Octane Settings. We're gonna go to Settings and Color Management, and we're going to navigate to that config file right here. Once you have that locked in, all we're really gonna do is go to the Camera Imager. We're gonna go to OCIO, and we're gonna make sure that we go to Aces Rec 709, Aces Rec 709. Basically from there, you're gonna be able to select the Aces Rec 709 color profile and it's gonna load it up like this. And you know it works when you select the Octane camera tag, you go to camera imager, right? We checked it on earlier. And you shouldn't be able to adjust the gamma. If I move this gamma up and down, nothing should happen. And that's how we know it works. But what we can do is we can take this exposure and we can say, let's go to like three or something. The way it rolls off with the highlights is just absolutely beautiful. When you go to render this out, it's not gonna look like this. So if you go to the export settings here, if we do an octane render, it's exactly what we want. We go to our octane render settings. We can change this buffer type to 8-bit and take the color space to OCIO and we can select our color space output and we'll do rec 709. That way it just kind of looks like what we're seeing here. You can do all your stuff in DaVinci later. You can of course export in normal ACES and then change your DaVinci project settings to work in ACES and do it that way. But I just like to keep things simple and do it like this. I'm really, really happy with these results. So let's give it a render and see what it's looking like. All right, so this is what we just made. At first glance, this is just too fast for me. And you can actually see all the repetitive textures on the puddles and whatnot. So what I did is render out a slower version where you can actually tell what the camera shake is doing. You can actually see 
the reflections and the puddles on the road a little bit more, you can see the detail that we added a bit more. This is a lot better for me. Now, the orbiting HDRI is a little intense. It is going a little fast for me. So for my final version, I switched out the HDRI, I left it as is, and I'm very happy with these results right here. And take a look at the difference between the raw render and the processing in DaVinci. It's a very, very simple setup. I'm using film grain on top. I have a little lens effect that I'm bringing in very subtly. And as far as color correction goes, it's a very simple setup. This first node right here is just a color boost. The second one is a pretty harsh vignette using this uh, little circular window here and dropping the gamma. And the third one is just a very subtle glow, and that's it. The difference between the raw render and the processed DaVinci render is huge for me, and it's such a simple thing to do. Don't miss it, it's important. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me, guys. I really appreciate it. If you learned a thing or two, leave a comment down below. Let's get a little chat going. Subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Definitely look into the Asus Pro Artist Awards. It's a super cool way to stretch yourself as an artist over these next few months here before we get into our August community challenge because we're gonna do another one, y'all. So thank you guys again. Have a good one. I'll catch y'all soon. Peace.